allow. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, everyone. I hope you have a good rest, sleep, and you are refreshed. Right? Just as I hope it was through the ministry of God's word that you were refreshed yesterday also. Okay? And so, what we're going to do now is we're going to spend today and... Uh, Today is going to be a long day, right? Because we have a lot of time that's going to be actually spent in God's Word. And so I hope you're excited. Right? I hope you're expecting the Lord to do things right, during, okay, throughout this day. Okay, so let me just get set up here. Okay. It's difficult with a handheld mic because you need actually a few more arms. Okay, and we're going to do this. Let's open our Bibles to Ruth chapter 2. All right, we're going to be in Ruth chapter 2. And we will read All right, verses 1 to verse 13. Okay, verse 1 to verse 13. So let's all stand. And we're going to read that responsively. And I'll begin with the first verse and you right, we'll go ahead with the the second. Verse one and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And she went and came and gleaned in the field of the reapers and her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Then said Boaz unto his servant that was set over the reapers, Whose damsel is this? And she said, I pray you, let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheep. So she came and had continued even from the morning until now, that she tarried a little in the house. Let thine eyes be on the field that uh, let, my, uh, let thine eyes be on the field that they do reap And go after them Have I not charged the young men that they shall not touch thee And when thou art a thirst Go unto the vessels And drink of that which the young men have drawn And Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath fully been showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother <coughs> in the land of thy nativity, and art come unto a people which thou knewest not heretofore. Then she said, Let me find favour in thy sight, my Lord, for that thou hast comforted me, and for that thou hast spoken friendly unto thine handmaid, though I be not like unto one of thine handmaids. Right? And, what was it? Yeah. Okay, and may God bless, bless to us the reading of his word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for even your word, which is inspired, preserved, Inerrant and Lord, that you have given it to us to build us up and to profit us. Yeah. That every word is profitable for us. That it will build us up in so many ways, whether by way of re 
reprove, or rebuke, or correction, instruction in righteousness. But Lord, it also comforts us. And I pray and ask this morning as we deal with this chapter that you open to us our understanding to show all your amazing and incredible mercy and grace even unto thy people even when we go through a difficult time challenging times and time of trial and time of trouble that you're not far from us I pray and ask Lord that you also open our eyes to your truth that all this comes not just merely from thy divine hand but how you work through your people and that there is a need for us therefore for, to also endeavor to be a help encouragement and blessing to others open our eyes also to see that even when our eyes cannot see you and because of our pain and our troubles that you seem far away that you're actually there and your hand is working I pray and ask that you use me as your instrument fill me thy spirit help me Lord to teach and preach with power and I would, Lord that help us to also be tender hearted always ready to respond and so Father open our eyes of understanding and Lord I pray that these lessons will stir our hearts and will be a strong encouragement to all of us here we thank thee we ask this in Christ's name we pray Amen we're, going to, we're coming to chapter 2 of Ruth but before we get there we're just going to wrap up a little bit of chapter 1 because Ruth follows Naomi right? and they return back to Israel and they go in chapter 1 verse 19 they arrive back in a hometown called Bethlehem the name is familiar because it is also called the city of David This will be the place where the future king of Israel will be born. Not just one king, but actually also the king of kings. Okay? But this move and this decision to go back to Bethlehem is very critical because this will set in motion events that will continue to unfold over the centuries. Alright? That King David and then the son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, will be born in that city of Bethlehem that has an impact even to today. And here, I want us to realize that this place okay, will make its mark. This small, tiny little town will leave its mark throughout all history. She returns back, Naomi changed because of the events that have, the painful events that have happened in her life. All right, Christian? You know, the Lord gives us joy through the Holy Ghost. Okay, and that is in spite of all the things that happen. One of the greatest books written in the Bible, right, about joy was Paul's epistle to the Philippians but it was written in prison the one who needed to be encouraged the most was the one who gave strong encouragement to everybody else why? because we can find joy in whatsoever state we are in why? because of the comfort of God because of the Holy Spirit of God now here Naomi returns and she changes her name. She declares to everyone, she says, what? Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty had dealt very bitterly with me. And 
It's interesting because she refers to God right, by a very well-known name in Hebrew, Shaddai. Almighty, the Almighty One. Now, I want, us, I want to just make one note here before we actually get into chapter 2. Now, you can be doctrinally and theologically correct. All right? She calls Him the Almighty One. She acknowledges the sovereignty of God. But have you accepted that? Because she was bitter about that. You see what I'm saying here? Because there are two ways we do to even approach this. When you think about the sovereignty of God, you want it gives you great comfort. Why? Because you know that He is in control. Right? That he, he directs all things, He's in control, and because He loves us and He declares His, his love and His grace towards us, that you know we can rest and we can we don't have to be stressed out. Or in Naomi's case, she's very bitter, why? Right? Because He is the Almighty One, He is sovereign, but I am not in control of all these things that's happening in my life. And you know what? I am not happy. Do you see what I'm saying here? Because you can know biblical truth, but until you surrender and accept that, you could find yourself still wrestling with God. And so Naomi has accepts this, but in a very grudging way because she believes that it is because of His sovereignty she is in suffering and pain as if God hates her. It's like a Calvinist view of God. He either loves you, blesses you, or He hates you. And she feels like a victim. Now, go down to verse 22, because this sets the stage for chapter 2. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, right? So they left Moab, they returned back into Israel, and they came to Bethlehem. Okay, so I want us at the start this this uh, lesson to realize here that in doing so, as Naomi acknowledges that in fact it was the Lord that had done all these things to her, and now she is forced to come back home. Okay, through His sovereignty. What, she, what I want us to see now is God's hand working behind the scenes. Okay? These painful circumstances and all that, and she is bitter about, bitter about this, but she's forced to return back. Not only that, but she now brings along a young believer, Ruth. Okay? And then, this is the beginning of what seems to be a series of coincidences. She goes to Israel, she goes to Bethlehem. And then, notice one thing, in verse 22, the timing of this is also important. Because it says here, in the beginning of barley harvest. Okay? Because of the barley harvest, because of all the activity that is going to happen during that time, a, num a series of events are going to happen in chapter 2. You realize that God has His timing in all, these, in all events? And there is a right time and, and there is an, also an inappropriate time. And this time, this was the beginning of the barley harvest where obviously because you have a harv you know, the, the barley is going to be harvested, there are harvesters. So let's go to all right, so that's one set of coincidences. Now, let's look at verse 1. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husbands, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Now, so she goes, Naomi and Ruth go to Bethlehem, and it so happens that it was the barley harvest. It so happens that there was a relative, a, a kinsman, all right, a relative of her husband, and he so happened to be a mighty man of wealth. 
Alright, so happened to be a of the family of Limelech, and his name was Boaz. Now, the scriptures do not record for us why Naomi made no mention about Boaz until now. Okay, and even now he's not mentioned. The scriptures declare to us that he happened to be living in that town. They are, remember, they're kinsmen, they're relatives, and they lived in this town before. It's not as if they, Naomi doesn't know he exists. Why she, why she never turned to him for help, we don't know. But again, you and I know that, uh, we mentioned yesterday that sometimes when people are hurting, we push everybody away. We don't want to turn to anybody else. We just want to be alone. We just want to be left on our own and we just want to hurt. We're hurting and we just want to feel that way. And can I warn everyone sometimes it becomes addictive. We just want to stay in that state. We just want to keep feeling that way. Which is why the music of the world doesn't resolve anything because you feel that way. I say, yeah, I like to listen to this because that's how I feel. But do you realize something? It never moves you forward. You're stuck. Now, here, they go back, right? And this information is not known to Ruth. But look at verse 2. It says, And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. Now, I want to see here that Ruth goes back together with Naomi and while they are there now something has to be done they are now settling into a new place new home right for Ruth is a new country both are widows nobody is going to take care of them they're going to have to take care of themselves and Ruth makes the decision here you know Naomi is old right my mother-in-law is old but I'm young I can do something about our situation. So she noticed she said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field. Alright? You notice she, she is still under authority uh, with respect to her mother in law. She says, Give, Okay, she's asked for permission. Why don't you just let me go to the field? Alright? And it says, What shall she do? It says, And glean corns, uh, glean ears of corn. Alright? Now, this is the barley harvest and the lawn in his wisdom, in the law of Moses, has provided a way to take care of the poor and the orphans. It was already provided for by design in the law concerning gleaning. You see, man today will try to solve these problems, you know, through social justice and and you know, there is a big emphasis on socialistic type principles. But you realize among God's people, God already provided a plan and a way. Amen. Right? In Israel, under the law of Moses, it will be through the law of gleaning. And we're going to go into detail what that means. Right? But that was a way where she says, if she goes to the fields and she gleans, now she just picks up whatever's the leftovers. Right? She can actually gather the corn. Now, Realize that even in the New Testament church time, the way we do this is through charity one towards another. As believers do this, minister to others. Okay, we don't need government and social programs actually if Christians would do what we are supposed to do. And here as a nation, God provided a way, right, such that those who own the fields during the harvest time can Harvest, they will make a profit, but they will also be able to take care of the poor and needy. Today, we actually have to come up with a term for this. and We, we say, you know, you want to have a socially responsible corporation or company. Now, he says, okay, let me go glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. Now, she knows this is not going to be easy. She is a foreigner, a Moabitess. She's going to go in there and not everyone is going to accept her. But she says, I'm going to trust the Lord, right? And that I will go and he, the Lord will, 
help me find favor with someone and whoever I shall find grace grace with I'm going to stick there I'm going to glean during this harvest time and so Naomi says says unto her go my daughter all right go ahead now just a quick thought here realize this now even within the New Testament church now, the Lord gives all of us a mind. He gives us the mind of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit. Now, I believe there is room for individual initiative, but work with authority. I don't think there's anything wrong with, Pastor, I've, you know, I've, I've thought about doing this and uh, there's this thing, whatever, and what do you think about this, right? And then we, we cooperate that. And even if you have to, if you're going to work on this indep independently, all right, there is, we can work in coordination. Now, she goes to Naomi, she tells her all right, what she planned to do, and Naomi says, yeah, I think that's fine, go. All right. Now, you notice something about Ruth also, that in doing so, she has determined that you know, she is going to do whatever is in her ability and strength to take care of their situation and to take care of her mother-in-law. Right? She's not sitting there and just hoping that something will happen. Many times we want the Lord to move, but we're not prepared to do anything. We're not prepared to take a step forward. And it's easier for God to direct you when you are actually doing something and moving forward. Then you're not doing anything at all. Now, because of that, now this sets things in motion because now she goes out and she's out into the field and this is going to now set the wheel spinning. All right? Because we're going to see here the meeting with Boaz. Okay? This first half of the chapter there was the, will be the meeting with Boaz. And we are introduced to him in verse 3. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers and her hap was to light on the part of the field belonging to onto Boaz who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Now, I don't know about you, but have you noticed something by now? Alright, have you noticed something by now about there has been a series of events, of things happening. Okay. And she goes to the field of Boaz and she is going to glean. Now, we need to understand a bit about gleaning. Let's turn to Leviticus 19 verse 9. And we're going to look at God's law concerning gleaning. Verse 9, And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest, and thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou glean every grape of thy vineyard, and thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. You notice that? I am the Lord your God. Now, this law is such that it tells the plantation owners, right, that they are forbidden by the law of God to optimize their harvest. When they're doing the work of harvesting, now what happens is that the rule is they will gather everything into the arms or into the baskets and all that, but whatever falls to the ground, <coughs> whatever they forgot to pick, you don't come back a second time or third time. You leave it. Why? This is God's provision for the poor and for the stranger, the foreigner. You notice God's laws are such that they actually make room, they actually, it, it's there where there is grace and kindness even to the foreigner in our midst. Most of us here are, if you, if you're, most of you here, if you're living in Cambodia, you are a stranger in a strange land. Right? Filipinos living in, in Singapore, they are a stranger in my country. Sadly, many times, in many countries, people don't treat strangers kindly. Alright? But here, 
You notice, there was a provision. Now, whatever drops on the ground, it says even, this is not only the, that they were not supposed to glean the vineyard, you're not supposed to glean every grape. Okay, so if there's a bit of leftover, whatever, you're supposed to leave it alone. Why? Because now permission is granted through the law of Moses that the poor and the stranger can come and they will harvest what's left over. Okay? I, I, I heard in, the, in book, book It Known, especially sometimes uh, during harvest time, the, a lot of people are not in church because if you're not there to harvest your own plantation in your field, other people will come and harvest while you're away. Okay? But this provision is there after you have done the main job of harvesting, but you're not supposed to try to do a... In other words, it's not supposed to go to every possible corner of the field, all right? They just do it roughly, and then if there's stuff that uh, is left over, it's okay. You leave it. Now, if they were carrying the corn, if that falls out of your hand, you, you don't turn around pick it up again. You leave it, why? For somebody else. Okay? These days, um, you know, in modern manufacturing, Part of the thing about keeping the manufacturing cost low is to make sure that there's no wastage at all. Okay? I know one mother who actually went from factory to factory looking for all the scraps, all the leftovers, uh, uh, cables that were discarded, and all these things. And she helped feed her family for many years that way, even though the children despise her for that. Now, this was a provision. God did that, all right, so that there was no actual need for government programs. In His wisdom, that everyone takes responsibility for caring for the needs of the poor and the stranger. It's easy because we, in, in delegating our responsibility, for instance, to a, a government or whatever, we no longer have to do this. It's very convenient for us. But notice how God implements the program. It's different. Right? He brings it down to everyone, where everyone plays a part. And in every form of harvest, we can leave things behind so that others can glean. Okay? In other words, there's no wastage or, or things that are ungathered. Why? Because things are left behind on purpose to help the poor and the stranger. And so, now, this works two ways. Okay? In, in doing so, this, there are two, two implications here. It works two ways. One, because all the owners have to trust God. That if they will do it this way, that it will still be profitable for them. There is no need to over-optimize the profit. Right? By making sure they gather everything. Nothing is left over. But the poor and the stranger are, have to also trust God that when God lays this law, that He is more than able to provide for their needs. You see what I'm saying here? It works two ways. And in addition to that, when you look at this law of gleaning, all right, now, because this is in the law of Moses, Ruth can argue that this is her right. Okay? She has a right to go to the fields to glean. But notice what her words were previously. She said, in whose, I think is it, um, in whose sight I shall find grace. She doesn't take it for granted. It, she doesn't look at it that this is my entitlement. No one's going to stop me. All right? It says, whoever I shall find grace, whoever welcomes me, I will glean from there. Even though the law of Moses says she has a right. All right? And if she's helping, and represent, helping Naomi, she's representing her. Naomi has a right. But she doesn't say... She doesn't demand that and say, no, this is my right. This is in the constitution, blah, blah, blah. You know, I demand my rights. This is whoever I shall find grace. And she's going to trust God to direct her to the right place 
to glean. Okay? Now remember, Ruth is the young believer. But she is taking steps of faith. She's going to trust God's word says this. I'm going to obey this. God has provided for this through his word. I will trust it. Right? I'm going to trust that God will direct me to the right place so that I can glean. And that we will gather, just from picking the leftovers, we will gather enough to be able to take care of our needs. But here you see a picture of Ruth trying to solve problems God's way. You see what I'm saying here? Trying to solve problems God's way because many times we are prone to lean to our own understanding. And because we do that, we try to solve things our own way rather than trusting God that however illogical it may be, however uh, unreasonable it may seem, however that His way is always the best way. So she's going to trust Him. So she takes the steps forward, she goes. Now, so she says, whoever's feel, she shall find grace. And so she is putting her faith to practice. Now, I mentioned this before, so I, I'm just bringing it up again. Now, what you see here is experimental faith in action. Right? God's word says this, she will hold God to that promise. What will she do now? I will act on that knowledge. And I'm going to trust God that He will do what He says. Okay, Just like in a science experiment, what do we do? We see the theory, we know the theory, and the next thing now we will conduct an experiment based on that theory, and then through the results, it will prove and confirm what we already know about that theory. Right? We trust that it will produce the correct results, it will verify the same thing. Now, many as I mentioned many times, we are more, because of our modern day church culture, we are more into experiential faith rather than an experimental faith. Here, Ruth is taking God at His word. She's going to trust Him, right? And she's expecting that it will provide for her needs. And so, Naomi lets Ruth go. Now, look at verse 3. Okay? Because... Okay, she takes, makes a rule, makes a decision to take action and to work. Right, she's not afraid to work. Now, notice verse three. She was divinely led to Boaz's field. God is the one that leads her. It says, and she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. Right, and her help was to light on a part of the field belonging onto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Now, she has no idea who Boaz is. Okay? Naomi does, but Ruth doesn't. But, are you seeing a coincidence here? Alright? Beginning from the move to Israel, they settle into Bethlehem. Bethlehem, which happens later, you're going to see, it's going to be what? The, the place where David was born. It will be the place where the Lord Jesus Christ was, was born. Alright? Um, she comes there, it happens to be at the time of the barley harvest. Now, she goes to glean in a field after, to follow after the reapers and she picks up whatever's left over and notice this word, hap. Her hap was to light on the part of the field. Three letters. Meaning, she so happened to end up in the field belonging to OS. Coincidence? We've got is there such a thing as coincidence? Hmm? Or with God, are there things such as planned coincidences? Now, most of the time we will not realize this until in hindsight. Right? So, she happened to glean in a part of field that belonged to Boaz, who just happened to be a relative of Elimelech. Now we see things like that happen over and over again in the scriptures. Now, example, Acts chapter 8, verse 26. What happens? Saul of Tarsus went on the rampage. He, he goes on around destroying church after church, right? Because of the persecution. Now, Philip now 
and others they have to scatter and they went everywhere preaching the word right the, under persecution the, the church in Jerusalem scattered and now think about this bitter terrible painful events come and yet God is still directing things. Look at Acts 8 verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read, Isaiah's the prophet. Now, what happens now? Under the direction of the angel of the Lord, right? Philip goes all the way onto Gaza. Now, Gaza, it's, it, verse 26 tells us it is what? Desert. Can you imagine the Lord tells you, go to this empty, forsaken place where nobody is? And many of us will be wondering why. Why, Lord? Why? There's nobody there. You want me to preach the gospel? You need to bring me to a place where there are lots of people, where there's an audience. He goes to this place. There's nobody out there. It's desert. What is he going to do? Preach to the lizards? To the scorpions and the snakes? Alright? Now, but notice. So he arose and went. He trusted the Lord. By, and he is led there and notice it so happened that a man of Ethiopia he, who happens to be a eunuch right under Candace queen of the Ethiopians happened to be there traveling and you notice verse 28 this is, happened to be sitting in his chariot who happened to be reading from Isaiah chapter 53 more than one series of you see a whole series of coincidences he accidentally discovered a eunuch what are the odds of finding an Ethiopian who believes in the Old Testament faith hmm? what are the odds of that alright who happened to have made a visit to Jerusalem to worship God in his temple and then he's going back now to his queen. I like to use this phrase in Singapore. Okay, when I'm in Singapore, it says, accidentally on purpose. And what I want us to see here is that God is able, if we would allow ourselves right, to be easily directed by him, to be steered left or right in any direction, any time, that he can accidentally on purpose bring a series of events to direct our paths. That in all ways, if we would acknowledge him, he shall direct thy paths. All right? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. Now, Philip would have, humanly speaking, just like us, struggled with this and wrestle with God, why do I have to go out there? It's a long trip out there with the prospect of probably coming back with nothing. No results. Remember, he was in the middle of a great spiritual revival. Where? In Samaria. Right? He had preached. There was great joy in the city. People were getting saved. A new church was being started and all that. And then God, in the middle of the whole thing, says, drop everything, just go out into the middle of nowhere. But, 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 how about all this? And what happens? Because there is a divine appointment. The Ethiopian, you know, after he was saved and baptized, brought that faith all the way into Ethiopia. And by the way, the evidence of that still exists today. Okay? Because you're going to see there are buildings. It's amazing. Where there is a big, huge round hole in the ground. And there is an eight-story building carved out of rock in the shape of a cross. All right? There are a number of these going all the way down. Okay? It's designed in such a way that attackers will have difficulty even coming in to attack or to destroy the, the, those church buildings. 
And they still exist today. Philip, in doing this, the eunuch will be the one that will bring the gospel to Ethiopia. God can di- purposefully direct us if we are available, right? Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Don't argue, don't wrestle with Him. Lean not onto thine own understanding. Even if you can't figure it out, trust Him. In all thy ways, acknowledge Him. In everything that we do, it says, And He shall direct thy paths. Okay? Now, there are many of such coincidences now. Um, I attended, years ago, I attended a pastor's conference, one that I would not recommend to anyone. But I was there because I was going to observe and you know, I was checking things out to see who, the, the, where things were going. Now, all the, all the people there, all right, at the end of one session, I turned around, I looked at another preacher, he looked at me, and then we became friends. And guess what? We so both so happened to be there we so happen to be very like-minded in our convictions and our doctrine, which differed greatly from the majority of the people that were attending the conference. Now, what were the odds of that? We continue over the years that after 12 years or more, guess what? We're supporting him as one of our missionaries today. So happened. Even right to the point when, when we left the conference, we so happened to be on the same bus to the airport. Right? You realize that God can direct even two random people such that they are like-minded. Now, by the way, go to the singles, do you, are you seeing a picture here? God can so happen to direct you and somebody else such that you eventually come together Hmm? but most of the time it's not going to happen because we keep trying to figure it out we keep trying to work this thing now he can purposefully direct random things to happen right turn to first kings chapter 22 Here, we're going to see that the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat go to battle. Verse 30, king of Israel, this is Ahab, said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and enter into the battle, but put thou on thy robes. And the king of Israel disguised himself and went into the battle. So, they go to battle, but the king of Israel, now, he hates the prophet of God. He says, he never says nice things about me. I hate him. He never says things I like to hear. Right? He puts him in prison. But he prophesied. God's man prophesied that Ahab would die in battle. He hates him, but he took it seriously. He decided, you know what? I'm going to go into battle, but I'm going to put on a disguise. I'm going to, not going to dress like the king. All right? I'm just going to dress like an ordinary soldier. He tells Joseph at the King Joseph at that, and this there, there's a whole lesson on separation right there. All right, King Joseph at should not was in the wrong place, wrong time, and was working with the wrong people. Okay, now, so what happens? But the king of Syria, verse thirty-one, commanded his thirty and two captains that had rule over his chariot, saying, "Fight neither with small nor great, save only with the king of Israel." It says, don't even f- bother with any of the soldiers or the enemies or the other chariots or whatever. Just go straight for the king of Israel. Kill him. And it came to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Joseph at that they said, Surely it is the king of Israel. And they turned aside to fight against him. And Joseph had cried out. You see? You work with the wrong people and you're going to get into trouble. And it came to pass when... okay. When the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, that they turned back from pursuing him. Now, King Joseph had only survived this battle only because of the grace and mercy of God. So don't be presumptuous and say, well, nothing bad came out of it, so it must be okay. okay? But look at verse 34. Coincidences. And a certain man drew a bow at a venture. In other words, he pulled on the bow, he pointed it up into the sky, he aimed randomly, he fired a random shot. 
and smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. Notice this man just pointed, he, aim, he wasn't aiming. He just fired at random. It so happened all right, that this guy fired at random. It so happened that the arrow went up into the sky and then it happened to find the king of Israel, Ahab, even though he was wearing a disguise. It so happened to find that arrow find its way in between the joints of his armor. If it hit any part of the armor, it would have just deflected off. It went in between the pieces of the armor. God can direct a random arrow and still find this mark. All right? Between the joints of the harness, and then you notice, verse 35, that the king of Israel says, died at even in the evening, and the blood ran out of the wound into the midst of the chariot. Even when he purposefully disguised himself to avoid being attacked. And, you know, this, this ought to also remind us, you know something, there is an appointed, all right, it is appointed unto man who wants to die. After this, the judgment. You cannot escape that appointment. And that's why we need to warn and remind people and to plead with them. Why? Because you cannot escape death. And when death comes, they're going to have to face their judge. Okay? Will they enter into eternal life or will it be eternal judgment? Now, think about this because this incident, some of us are struggling with God and resting with Him. Do you think God is powerless when He can direct a random arrow to the right person to kill to go into the just at the precise spot where the armor is most vulnerable and then remember it was a killing blow Ahab bled to death and we don't think that God is able to help us through the situation we're in that God is unable to help us with the finances of our church or the, our home, our family. That uh, even in the face of maybe there could be a conflict, I want to do this, but there's this other thing, and this is the right thing, but uh, how do I choose whether that God is unable to direct us to, do, to make the right decision? Think about this. It's been one series of coincidences after another, but God is the one directing everything behind the scenes. Right? I know, we feel powerless because right, in the world that we live in, all right, ever since Adam fell, now random things happen that are beyond our control. We recognize that. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11 says, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise. You see that? Right? The race is not always won by the fastest but by the most skillful and the smartest. And even then, there is no guarantee. That is why sports is so exciting. There is always a random element. There is so always some degree of unpredictability. The best team that, can go, that goes in the finals could still lose. Oh, we like that sometimes, the upset win. All right? And here it says the race is not always going to go to the swiftest. It says, nor the battle to the strong. You realize that? And over and over again, if you study military history, over and over again, sometimes the inferior force can defeat, right, very decisively, the superior attacking force. It says, neither yet bread to the wise. Just because you are the smartest, you will have the most degrees and the most qualifications it doesn't always mean that you will be the best, earth, best earner. Now, there is a reason for that. It says, nor yet riches to men of understanding. Okay? The best educated doesn't always be, is not always going to be the wealthiest. 
nor yet favor to men of skill. Now, this, is, this part is very painful for many of us. We always believe if we work hard, right, what will happen? The doors will open to us. But it says here, favor doesn't always go to men of skill. It says, but time and chance happeneth to them all. Now, you have to remember one thing. When you look at Ecclesiastes, that Solomon is speaking from a humanistic perspective. All right? And his humanistic observation is that the universe seems to be full of random things beyond our control. And he says here, time and chance. Okay? But what I want to do, do realize is that while there is no such thing as chance, God does seem to work through coincidences, so to speak. He directs things and then it, in ways that we don't understand. But the other thing is timing does have a, and does play a part. Okay? Timing. I know many of us are making, having to make decisions, but you have to realize sometimes the right time is just as important as the right decision. You see what I'm saying here? And one thing we, I did years back, I think this was in 2004, was we realized that it was time for us to move our church, for us to move to a new place and we needed the space and we needed to settle down in somewhere more permanent. Now, as we started looking, we found a place. We saw the place, it looks like it will fit all our needs, but there were still some issues and the biggest issue was, I realized as a church, we were not ready to make a decision. The timing was not right. As I prayed, I asked the Lord to keep the place available for us for as long as possible until we're ready to make a decision. Guess what happened? The Lord kept that place available for one year. At the end of one year, just before we were about to sign the agreement, we were directed to another place two buildings away. And as it turned out, that was the right place. Now, if it was a year ago, that place would not have been available. Not only would that place not be available, but the hearts of everyone was not ready to commit to that decision. To force the issue at that time would have been disastrous. Okay? I know that because we needed... Um, how much would that be? Uh, I think we needed close to four million, four million pesos, All right, to be able to move and move in, set up everything, whatever. Which a year at that time would not be possible, even though we had the money, because why right, nobody was going to agree to it. But a year later, the time was right. And at that very last minute before we were going to sign on an agreement, we were directed to another place. At the moment I went there, I said, this is it. I knew this was it. We brought our members down. They looked at the place. They were very excited. They, they knew this, was, this would be the place. And because of that, we didn't have the money. Right? We, again, it so happened, we raised the money within three weeks. Why? Because again, the timing. Time is important. Okay? But we realize here, humanistically speaking, Solomon attributed the whole universe and everything to randomness. But God is not at the mercy of random things. He is the master over even a random universe. Alright? Now, I want to see Ruth trusted in the Lord's providence. All she had to do was this. The law had already laid down what, would, what needs to be done, right? how she would be provided for. All she had to do was what? To operate in faith. Right? If she did her part, God would do His part. It's as simple as that. By the way, nothing has changed. If you go back to Genesis, right? in the Garden of Eden, what was the, what was the job? It was very simple. God gave Adam a job to do. Adam purpose was this. He will take care of God's business. Now, concerning what to eat, then God will take care of His business. 
That rule still applies today. You take care of God's business, you let God take care of your business. Hmm? Most of the time, the problem is that we want to take care of God's business. I mean, we want to tell God what to do, we want to direct Him. Some of us can't even manage our day-to-day -day life. We want to manage God. I think He's well able to better manage our lives. All right? Why don't you trust Him? But you take care of what He wants us to do. Now, David's testimony of the Lord was this. Verse, Psalm 37, uh, verse 25. I have been young and now am old. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread? Right? Now, he's pointing out this is something as a testimony and observation. He's not seen the righteous ever forsaken by God, nor their children begging for bread. He says, referring to God, he is ever merciful and lender, and his seed is blessed. Depart from evil and do good, and dwell evermore. For the Lord love of judgment forsaketh not his saints. Notice that. They are preserved forever, but the seed of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell therein forever. Okay? Those who experimentally trust the Lord and follow Him, God will provide for them, will care for them. They never need to beg for bread. Right? And they never have to worry. Why? Because God will not forsake them. My question is this. Do you trust Him? Do you believe that? All right? The problem is this, most of us, we don't believe that, we don't trust that, and so because of that, we face much anxiety in life. Right? We feel that we have to take things into our own hands. Here, verse 26 tells us, God is merciful. Right? He will lend to those in need, and His seed is blessed. Right? God loves judgment. According to verse 28, He will see to it there is justice. Let us sink it for a while. Because so many times we are struggling because we see injustice and we feel that we need to take it into our own hands to right the wrong. Instead of turning to the God who is the righteous judge, who sees everything even behind the scenes, who is able to set things right. But we rarely go to Him. We decide we want to be the judge. We want to be the one to execute justice. And I'm not surprised if today there's, there's some of us here sitting, sitting here that are just like that. We're in that situation because we want to take that from God. Notice, He will not forsake His saints in the context of facing injustice, oppression and unfairness. Okay? But some of us here are wrestling for control. Look at what Ruth did. She yielded that control to the Lord. Right? Even though she's powerless, she has no voice. Right? She has no political voice at all. Who is she? She's just a stranger. But she steps forward and says, I am going to trust God right, with my needs. I'm going to trust Him to do what is right for Naomi and myself. God has laid it out in His Word as to how it will be done. I'm going to take Him at His Word. Experimental faith. I'm going to trust that this will produce the correct outcome in my life. Okay? I can't figure it out. I don't know how that's going to work. But He is far wiser Right? The wisdom of God is far greater than all the wisdom of this whole universe put together. I'm going to trust Him. And so when she go goes through that, notice, right? she's trusting in His providence. Right? She trusts in His word. She's trusting that God will direct her to the right place, to the right people who will show grace to her. How does it begin? First step. Do I believe what he tells me? Do I believe his word? All right? Am I ready to submit to his word? That in making decisions, right, I'm not gonna I 
not going to reason this out. I'm not going to try to figure it out any other way. I just have to obey. And when we do that, I'm going to trust that if we're going to get into trouble, I have a right to ask him for help. All right? Ruth takes that step forward and says, okay, the law of God provides in this way. I'm going to trust that it will work. You get what I'm saying here? Now, at the heart of all this goes back to an issue which is dependence on the Lord. Right? Dependence on His word. I'm depending on His providence. I'm depending on His grace. Okay? Now, in a time of trouble, here's where we struggle. We're already feeling helpless. We don't like being dependent. We don't like to feel helpless. Naomi, even though she acknowledged the sovereignty of God, what was her problem? She struggled in her heart because what? She did not like the fact that because he's so sovereign, she was feeling very helpless. There's nothing she can do about her situation. Everything happened to her and she was bitter about it. Now you and I can find ourselves in that situation. You will know the truth. You know that He alone is sovereign. But we're not happy about this because we're resting. I need to be in control when I need to yield and surrender to His truth and then to take Him at His word, take that next step forward, trusting the promises of God. Okay? At the heart of this is a fight and rest, resting for who will sit on the throne. You or the Lord? Naomi, sorry, Ruth, as a young believer, made her choice. I'm just going to trust God for what He's, for what he's told to me. How all this is going to happen that's his problem I'm going to leave him in his wisdom to figure it out I'll let him direct my path and in so doing what happens she happened to go out gleaning she looked for a field she happened to find a field that, belonged, that happened to belong to Boaz alright and so she gleans there and then you're going to see as the chapter goes on he happened to talk to her okay so as this first step here as I close question for us all these things don't happen unless you and I are willing to allow him to direct us any way he wants We all, most of us will agree, say, I want the will of God for my life. But how willing are you to let Him direct in any way, even if it doesn't seem to make sense to you? Would you have allowed the Lord to direct you while you're in the middle of something very successful in, right, in Samaria, to go all the way to the middle of nowhere in Gaza, because God has arranged an appointment there for you. Would you have done that? Alright? And so, here, unless we allow Him to direct us, what happens is, is we're constantly fighting with God over who is in control. Alright? This has to do with your personal surrender. Alright? And this applies to every believer, every Christian. Because at the heart of the issue is, is, do you trust Him at all? If you do, then you will allow Him to direct. If you do, you will allow Him to right the injustice. Because why? He alone is the righteous judge. Right? But He will never forsake His people. So as we close for this session, I just want to ask a question to everyone here. How many of you 
are willing to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to hand you all control. I'm not going to negotiate. I'm not going to ask. The only question I'm going to ask is, what would thou have me to do? Right? And I want you to come before the Lord and as you offer that, you know, it's both hands. Don't hold anything back. Right? Will you do that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time in the Word and I pray that you continue to direct us. And Lord, I pray you help us to settle our hearts this morning as, we, as a starting point for the rest of this day. That we'll come to you in humble acknowledgement that you are sovereign, that you're in control, but we have to trust you in every way, not just grudgingly accept that you are sovereign. And Lord, I pray you help us to, those of us who have never tried this, that we will commit to an experimental faith. We'll take your word, we'll trust it, but we'll take our next step forward, believing that even if we haven't figured out how it's going to work, you have. And you know how. So Father, have your way with us. We ask this in Christ's name, pray. Amen.